The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. Chapter 8. There's no such thing as a sexual relationship. The dialectic of part and whole is crucial to Lacan's formulation of sexual difference or sexuation, as he calls it. In both the French and English language literature on the subject, Lacan's discussion is often mistakenly understood to center around um, the dialectic of all and some. This, mon- this misunderstanding is especially egregious in the translated chapters of Encore, Seminar 20, that appear in Feminine Sexuality. The dialectic of all and some is, rightly or wrongly, generally traced back to Aristotle, whereas the dialectic of part and whole is usually credited to the pre-Socratics and Hegel. Nevertheless, Lacan is a dialectic of part... Lacan's is a dialectic of part and whole with a twist. The whole is never whole, the other does not exist, and the part is undefinable, unsitu- unsituable, unspecifiable, and has nothing to do with the whole. His dialectic is thus likely to be more comprehensible to mathematicians familiar with modern developments in set theory and to post-structuralists than to those with more traditional philosophical backgrounds. There are many hurdles to be overcome in the presentation of Lacan's view of sexual difference. A number of authors writing in English, or whose work has been translated into English, have discussed Lacan's work on sexuation without having a firm grasp of other aspects of his thought. They have thus provided the reading public with with patently or partially false interpretations, and have critiqued views Lacan never espoused. It is no difficult task to latch onto one of Lacan's more metaphysical-sounding claims. A letter always reaches its destination. Take it out of context and attack it for what it does not mean, as Derrida does in The Purveyor of Truth. And anyone can locate the word phallus in Lacan's texts and tax him with phallocentricism. It is a far more difficult matter to sift through his voluminous explanations of sexual difference discern his central concerns, and isolate his main theses. What I propose to do here is, one, explain what Lacan means by castration, the phallus, and the phallic function. Two, indicate what Lacan is getting at with the notion that there is no such, th- no such thing as a sexual relationship. Three, lay out his formulas of sexuation in some, though by no, no means all, of their complexity so as to recenter the debate over sexual difference around what he actually says and for address certain broader issues raised by his account lacan clearly provides us with the wherewithal to look beyond the freudian terms of some of his own formulations we can by viewing castration as alienation the phallus as the signifier desire and the name of the father as um s and brackets, I forget what that means. I'm a dumbrate theory of sexuation that goes beyond Freud's largely culture specific terms. Castration. In seminar uh, 14, Lacan asks, What is castration? It is certainly not like the formulations little Hans put forward that someone unscrews the little faucet, for it nevertheless remains in place. What is at stake is that he cannot take his jouissance inside himself. Castration has to do with the fact that, at a certain point, we are required to give up some jouissance. The immediate implication of this is that Lacan's notion of castration focuses essentially on the renunciation of jouissance, and not on the penis, and therefore that it applies to both men and women insofar as they alienate, in the Marxist sense of the term, a part of their jouissance. Castration in Lacan's work is very closely related to alienation and separation. As we have seen in alienation, the speaking being emerges and is forced to give up something as he or she comes to be in language. Separation requires a second renunciation. The pleasure derived from the other is demand, from casting the other's demand as the object in fantasy, that is, the pleasure obtained from the drives. 
What happens to the jouissance that is sacrificed? Where does it go? Is it simply annihilated? Does it simply vanish? Or does it shift to a different level of or locus? The answer seems clear. It shifts to the other. It is, in a sense, transferred to the other's account. Now, what could that possibly mean? A certain jouissance that is squeezed out of the body is refound in speech. The other's language enjoys in our stead. Stated it differently, it is only insofar as we alienate ourselves in the other and enlist ourselves in support of the other's discourse that we can share some of the jouissance circulating in the other. When one reads Finnegan's Wake, one has the sense of the jouissance packed in the signifier, in the other as language. The con- concat- concatenations of letters and the linguistic finds seemingly just waiting in the language to be exploited suggest a life of language independent of our own. Strictly speaking, language obviously does not get off on itself, but it is insofar as the other as language is in us that we can derive a certain jouissance therefrom. The sacrifice involved in castration is to hand over a certain jouissance to the other and let it circulate in the other, that is, let it circulate in some sense outside of ourselves. That may take the form of writing, for example, or of the establishment of a body of knowledge, knowledge that takes on a life of its own, independent of its creator, as it may be added to or modified by others. Castration can thus be associated with other processes and other domains. In the economic register, capitalism requires the extraction of subtraction from the worker of a certain quantum of value, surplus value. That value, which is not so much a plus or surplus as a minus from the worker's point of view, is taken away from the worker. The worker is subjected to an experience of loss and transferred to the other qua free market. Surplus value equated in the last chapter with surplus jouissance, Lacan's plus plus de jouir, circulates in an alien world of abstract market forces. Capitalism creates a loss in its field, which allows an enormous market mechanism to develop. Similarly, our advent as speaking beings creates a loss, and that loss is at the center of civilization and culture. Freud talked about that loss in terms of instinctual renunciation that he considered necessary for all cultural achievement. He generally associated it with the Oedipus complex and its resolution, giving up one love object and having to seek another elsewhere, and believed that the renunciation required of girls is less than that required of boys, hence the supposedly lesser contribution of females to culture as a whole. In Lacan's work, the sacrifice of jouissance and the extent of the sacrifice should not be underestimated, for it leaves behind a mere pittance of pleasure, is necessitated by the other's demand that we speak, and is foiled only by the autist. That demand is obviously tied to all of culture, all bodies of knowledge, for without language we could have no access to any of them. Claude Levi Strauss may be understood as suggesting that a similar structure is at work in kinship rules. The exchange or circulation of women is based on a fundamental loss engendered by the incest taboo. Consider what he says in Structural Anthropology. Without reducing society or culture to language, we can initiate this Copernican revolution which will consist of interpreting society as a whole in terms of a theory of communication. This endeavor is possible on three levels, since the rules of kinship and marriage serve to ensure the circulation of women between groups, just as economic rules serve to ensure the circulation of goods and services, and linguistic rules serve to ensure the circulation of messages. If we modify this quote slightly, changing the theory of communication into a theory of the signifier, the circulation of women into the circulation of the signifier of desire, the circulation of goods and services into the circulation of surplus value, and the circulation of messages into the circulation of lack of jouissance and a corresponding corresponding surplus jouissance, we find the same structure in all three systems, 
a lack or loss is, is generated, which then circulates in the other. Lacan himself provides an example from the political register. No jouissance is given to me or could be given to me other than that of my own body. That is not clear immediately, but is suspected. And people institute around this jouissance, which is good, which is thus my only asset, the protective fence of a so-called universal law called the rights of man. No one can stop me from using my body as I see fit. The result of the limit is that jouissance dries up for everybody. <clears throat> a limitation is created in the form of a law, which is initially designed to give me the right to exclusive jouissance of my own body, prohibiting others from using it as they see fit. Yet the very same limitation nevertheless results in the destruction of my own jouissance. Such a notion is central to Lacan's reading of Freud in Seminar 7. For example, the reality principle places limits on the pleasure principle that are in the ultimate interest of the pleasure principle but goes too far. The renunciation imposed by the reality principle, re, reality principle is incommensurate with the function the reality principle is supposed to serve. Circuitous or deferred maintenance of the pleasure principle. Just as Freud, just as Freud's superego oversteps its boundaries, in a sense inflicting the most severe punishment precisely on those who act the most ethically, the law inevitably exceeds its authority. The symbolic order kills the living being or organism in us, rewriting it or overwriting it with signifiers, such that being dies, the letter kills, and only the signifier lives on. Limit, lack, loss, these are central to Lacanian logic, and they constitute what Lacan refers to as castration. They may, in particular case histories and particular sectors and phases of Western culture, often be associated with genitalia, the male organs tumescence and detumescence in children's theories of sex and where babies come from. Such particulars are, nevertheless, contingent compared to the structure of lack loss itself. <clears throat> The phallus and the phallic function. In its quest for love and attention, a child is sooner or later confronted with the fact that it is not its parents' sole object of interest. Their multiple and no doubt multifarious objects of interest all have one thing in common. They divert the parent's attention away from the child. The parent's attention is what has the highest value in the child's universe. It is the gold standard, so to speak that value against which all other values are measured. All objects or activities which attract their attention away from the child take on an importance they might otherwise never have had. Not surprisingly, one signifier comes to signify that part of the parent's desire which goes beyond the child, and by extension their desire in general. Lacan refers to it as the signifier of desire, and as man's desire is the other's desire, it can also be referred to as the signifier of the other's desire. It is the signifier of that which is worthy of desire, of that which is desirable. Psychoanalytic practice suggests, as do other practices, that in Western cultures in general, that signifier is the phallus. Though many claim that that is no more than a preconceived notion, psychoanalysis claims that it is a clinical observation, and as such, contingent. It is verified time and again in clinical practice and thus constitutes a generalization, not a necessary universal rule. There is no theoretical reason why it could not be something else, and there perhaps are and have been societies in which some other signifier plays or played the role of the signifier of desire. Why has the phallus come to play that role in our, in our society? Lacan provides various possible reasons. One might say that this signifier is chosen as that which is most salient or protruding. Uh, salient means both. Of what can be grabbed in sexual intercourse as real, as a real, not imaginary or, or symbolic activity, and also as that which is the most symbolic in the literal typographical sense of the term, since it is equivalent in intercourse to the logical copula, 
One might also say that by virtue of its tur- turgidity, tumescence, tum- it is the image of the vital flow as it is transmitted in generation. <clears throat> Whatever the reasons proposed for the de facto status of the phallus, and all such reasons are anthropological or imaginary in nature, not structural, the fact remains that in our culture, <clears throat> the phallus generally serves as desire's signifier. Now, the signifier of desire is not the same as the cause of desire. Desire's cause remains beyond signification, unsignifiable. Within Lacanian psychoanalytic theory, the term object A is obviously a signifier which signifies the other's desire insofar as it serves as cause of the subject's desire. Oh, sorry, it was object A in brackets. So... <clears throat> I feel like I may have missed a spot. But object A in brackets, considered to play a role outside of theory, that is, as real, does not signify anything. It is the other's desire. It is desirousness as real, not signified. The phallus, on the other hand, is never anything but a, but a signifier. In theory, just as in everyday language, it is the signifier of desire. Object A in brackets is thus the real, unspeakable cause of desire, while the phallus is the name of desire and thus pronounceable. Insofar as desire is always correlated with lack, the phallus is the signifier of lack. Its displacements and shifts indicate the movement of lack within the structure as a whole. Whereas castration refers to a primordial loss which sets the structure in motion, the phallus is the signifier of that loss. As Lacan says in his 1959 paper on Ernest Jones's theory of symbolism, the phallus is the signifier of the very loss the subject undergoes due to the breaking into pieces brought on by the signifier. Elsewhere in the same article, Lacan says that the phallus functions as the signifier of the lack of being, want in being or want to be, manca etre without the usual dashes that determines the subject in his relation to the signifier. It is thus the signifier of that loss or absence of being which is behind the subject's very relation to the signifier. There is no subject at the outset, and the signifier names the as-yet empty space in with or in which the subject will come to be. In his 1966 afterward to that article, Lacan writes, a symbol comes to the place of the lack constituted by the not in its place or missing from its place, manque à sa place, that is necessary for the initiation of the dimension of displacement from which the play of the symbol in its entirety derives. Um, it is clear here that a lack or loss of something is required to set the symbolic in motion. Perhaps the simplest way of putting this is as follows. Why would a child ever bother to learn to speak if all of its needs were anticipated, if its caretakers fed it, changed it, adjusted the temperature, and so on, before it even had a chance to feel hunger, wetness, cold, or any other discomfort? Or if the breast or bottle were always immediately placed in its mouth as soon as it began to cry? If nourishment is never missing... If nourishment is never missing, if the desired warmth is never lacking, why would the child take the trouble to speak? <clears throat> As Lacan says in the context of his discussion of anxiety, what is most anxiety-producing for the child is when the relationship through which it comes to be, on the basis of lack, which makes it desire, is most perturbed, when there is no possibility of lack when its mother is constantly on its back. Without lack, the subject can never come into being, and the whole efflorescence of the dialectic of desire is squashed. The lack in question in the case of the phallus is the lack of having, failure to have or possess, manque à avoir, engendered by any particular or global frustration of demand. 
that is precisely that lack which causes the subject to desire, not simply demand. Now the phallic function, as Lacan terms it, is the function that institutes lack, that is, the alienating function of language. As we shall see, the phallic function plays a crucial role in Lacan's definition of masculine and feminine structure, for the latter are defined differently in terms of that loss, that lack instituted by alienation, by the splitting brought on by our use of, or rather use by, language. As we shall also see, lack is introduced by the phallic function, and its circulation are by no means the whole story. Lacan's economy of jouissance is not a closed economy, governed by the laws of the conser conservation of jouissance, whereby what is sacrificed at one point is refound at another. No more, no less. Just as in Freud's economy, libido seems to be conserved, except when Freud talks about repetition and the excessive, incommensurate nature of the superego. In Lacan's economy, there seems to be a smooth displacement of lack and desire only as long as we confine our attention to the symbolic universe, defined by the signifier qua signifying. Everything changes when we broaden our perspective to include the real and the signifierness of the signifier. There's no such thing as a sexual relationship. L'être sexué ne s'autorise que de lui-même. From, and obviously, that is a quotation from Lacan, from Seminar 21. Having devoted half a century to the study of love, sex, and language, Lacan came out in the late 1960s with one of those bombshell expressions for which he was so well known. There's no such thing as a sexual difference. I lost my spot somehow. Oh, there's no such thing as a sexual relationship is actually what he said. The French wording is ambiguous in that rapport, rapport sexuel can be used to refer simply to sexual intercourse. Nevertheless, Lacan was not asserting that people are not having sex, a ridiculous claim to say the least. His use of the word rapport here suggests a more abstract realm of ideas. Relation, relationship, proportion, ratio, fraction, and so on. There is, according to Lacan, no direct relationship between men and women insofar as they are, they are men and women. In other words, they do not interact with each other as man to woman and woman to man. Something gets in the way of their having any such relationship. Something skews their interactions. There are many different ways of thinking about what such a relationship, if it existed, might involve. We might think that we would have something along the lines of a relationship between men and women, if we could define them in terms of one another, say, as opposites, yin and yang, or in terms of a simple complementary inversion like activity, passivity. Freud's model, albeit unsatisfactory even to his mind, we might even imagine associating masculinity with a sine curve and femininity with a cosine curve, for that would allow us to formulate something we might take to be a sexual relationship as follows. Sin, I don't know, it's a, a mathematical, an algebraic thing with a figure to show it, and you're going to have to look it up because I don't know math. It's page 104, though. The advantage of this particular formula is that it seems to account in a very graphic way for what Freud says in describing the different kinds of things men and women are looking for from each other. One forms the impression that the love of man and the love of woman are separated by psychological phase difference. Here, despite the apparent heterogeneity of the masculine and feminine curves, despite their phase lag, we would be able to combine them in such a way as to make them add up to one. But according to Lacan, no such equation is possible. 
nothing that would qualify as a true relationship between the sexes, can be either spoken or written. There is nothing complementary about the relationship, nor is there a simple inverse relationship or some kind of parallelism between them. Rather, each sex is defined separately with respect to a third term. Thus, there is only a non-relationship, an absence of any conceivable direct relationship between the sexes. Lacan sets out to show, one, that the sexes are defined separately and differently, and two, that their partners are neither symmetrical nor overlapping. And Alessands demonstrate day in and day out that their biomedically, genetically determined sex, genitalia, chromosomes, etc., can be at odds with both socially defined notions of masculinity and femininity, femininity and their own choice of sexual partners still assumed by many people to be based on reproductive instincts. Analysts are thus daily confronted with the inadequacy of defining sexual difference in biological terms. Lacan begins to explore a strictly psychoanalytic approach to defining men and women in Seminar 18, and continues doing so in the mid-1970s. His attempt may at first seem needlessly complex, and to include a great deal of extraneous material of Freudian origin. One must keep in mind, however, that Lacan was inventing as he developed this new way of distinguishing between the sexes, and did not necessarily always have a crystal clear idea of where he was going. I will attempt first to briefly explain the main outlines of his theory, only then proceeding to a discussion of the math themes which pose a serious obstacle to certain readers at the outset. Distinguishing between the sexes. Pure masculinity and femininity remain theoretical constructions of uncertain content. That was a quote from Freud. According to Lacan, men and women are defined differently with respect to language, that is, with respect to the symbolic order, just as Lacan's contribution to the understanding of neurosis and psychosis suggests that the latter involves a part of the symbolic that is foreclosed and returns in the real whereas the former does not. Masculinity and femininity are defined as different kinds of relations to the symbolic order, different ways of being split by language. His formulas of sexuation thus concern only speaking subjects, and I would suggest only neurotic subjects. The men and women defined in these formulas are neurotic, clinically speaking. Neurotic men differ from neurotic women in the way in which they are alienated by within the symbolic order. Men. Those who, from a psychoanalytic perspective, are considered to be men, regardless of their biological genetic makeup, are wholly determined by the phallic function, since the phallic function refers to the alienation brought about by language. Lacan's major point about men can be expressed in a variety of ways. Men are wholly alienated within language. Men are altogether subject to symbolic castration. Men are completely determined by the phallic function. Despite the infinite permutations allowed by language in the constitution of desire, man can be seen as bounded or finite with respect to the symbolic register. Translated in terms of desire, the boundary is the father and his incest taboo. Man's desire never goes beyond the incestuous wish, impossible to realize, as that would involve overstepping the father's boundaries and thus uprooting the very anchoring point of neurosis, le non du père, the father's name, but also le non du père, the father's no. No and no being homonyms in French. This is where it appears quite clear that masculine structure is in certain respects synonymous in Lacan's work with obsessive neurosis. Linguistically speaking, man's limit is that which institutes the symbolic order itself, That first signifier, S1, the father's no, which is the point of origin of the signifying chain and which is involved in primal repression, the institution of the unconscious and of a place for the neurotic subject. Man's pleasure is similarly limited, its boundaries being determined by the phallic function. Man's pleasures are limited to those allowed by the play of the signifier itself, to what Lacan calls phallic jouissance and to what might similarly be called symbolic jouissance. Here, thought itself is jouissance-laden, 
a conclusion amply borne out by Freud's work on obsessive doubt. Consider the case of the rat man. And felicitously reflected in the expression mental masturbation. Insofar as it is related to the body, phallic or symbolic jouissance involves only the organ designated by the signifier, which thus serves as a mere extension or instrument of the signifier. That is why Lacan occasionally refers to phallic jouissance as organ pleasure. Men's fantasies are tied to that aspect of the real that underwrites, as it were, the symbolic order, object A in brackets. Object A in brackets keeps the symbolic moving in the same circuitous paths in constant avoidance of the real. There is, for those who come under the category men, a kind of symbiosis between subject and object, symbolic and real, as long as the proper distance is maintained between them. The object here is only peripherally related to another person, and Lacan thus refers to the jouissance derived therefrom as masturbatory in nature. Women. While men are defined as being wholly hemmed in by the phallic function, wholly under the sway of the signifier, women, i.e. those who, from a psycho psychoanalytic perspective, are considered to be women, regardless of their biological genetic makeup, are defined as not being wholly hemmed in. A woman is not split in the same way as a man. Though alienated, she is not altogether subject to the symbolic order. The phallic function, while operative in her case, does not reign absolutely. With respect to the symbolic order, a woman is not whole, bounded, or limited. Whereas men's pleasure is altogether determined by the signifier, women's is partially determined by the signifier, but not wholly. While men are limited to what Lacan calls phallic jouissance, women can experience both that and another kind of jouissance, which he calls the other jouissance. Not that every subject who can be situated under women experiences it, far from it, as is so often attested, but it is, according to Lacan, a structural potentiality. What is that other jouissance of which those who, psychoanalytically speaking, are to be classified as women are capable? The very fact that Lacan spells other with a capital O here indicates the other's jouissance connection with the signifier, but it is connected with S1, not S2. Not with just any signifier, but with the other signifier, to coin a phrase, the unary signifier, the signifier that remains radically other, radically different from all other signifiers. Whereas S1, the father's no, functions for a man as a limit to his range of motion and pleasure, S1 is an elective partner for a woman her relationship to it allowing her to step beyond the boundaries set by language and beyond the pittance of pleasure language allows. An end point for men, S1 serves as an open door for women. Feminine structure proves that the phallic function has its limits and that the signifier isn't everything. Feminine structure thus bears close affinities to hysteria as defined in the hysterics discourse. Lacan's way, oh sorry, beyond biology. Lacan's way of defining man and woman has nothing to do with biology and can be understood as accounting for the existence of genetically male hysterics and genetically female obsessive compulsives. A male hysteric is, if my interpretation of Lacan is correct here, characterized by feminine structure. He may potentially experience both phallic and the other jouissance. A female obsessive compulsive is characterized by masculine structure, her jouissance being exclusively symbolic in nature. From a clinical vantage point, a great many biological females turn out to have masculine structure, and a great many biological males prove to have feminine structure. Part of an analyst's training must thus consist in breaking old habits of thought whereby one immediately assumes that a female is an hysteric and thereby can be characterized as having feminine structure. Each person's relation to the signifier and mode of jouissance has to be examined more carefully. One cannot jump to conclusions on the basis of biological sex. The fact that so many people cross over the hard and fast biological distinctions perhaps explains in part the widespread use in America of the category borderline, 
It is often precisely those patients who cross those boundaries who are diagnosed by psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, and psychologists as borderline. Lacan rejects the borderline category outright. Lacan's distinctive way of defining masculinity and femininity shows why there is no such thing as a relationship between the sexes. But this point must await clarification until man's partner and woman's partners are articulated in more detail below. Those altogether averse to Lacan's logical excursions would do well to skip to the section entitled A Dissymmetry of Partners. The Formulas of Sexuation In Seminar 20, Lacan provides a schema, part of which he had been working on for years, and part of which he claims to have whipped up in a flash the very morning before he first drew it on, on the blackboard at his seminar. Um, there's figure 8.2 on page 108 that you definitely need to look at because I'm not explaining it. I'll begin my interpretation of this schema by commenting on several, several passages from seminar 20. Masculine structure. We'll start with the four propositional formulas at the top of the table, two of which lie to the left, the other two to the right. Every speaking being situates him or herself on the on one side or the other. On the left, the lower line, which I can't read because I don't know the words for these symbols, indicates that it is through the phallic function that man as whole can be situated. The formula, again a bunch of symbols that I don't know the names of, thus means that the whole of a man falls under the phallic function. Um... To paraphrase this formula, man is altogether determined by symbolic castration, that is, every bit of him falls under the sway of the signifier. Returning to the quote, we see that there is an exception, however. Man as whole can be situated as determined by the phallic function, with the proviso that this function is limited due to the existence of an X by which the function, a bunch of symbols I can't read, is denied, a bunch more symbols I can't read. That is what is known as the father's function. The whole here is thus based on the exception. The exception posited as the term that altogether negates a bunch of symbols I can't read. Man can be considered as a whole because there is something that delimits him. Example, there exists some X, some subject or part thereof, such that symbols that I can't read, the phallic function is foreclosed. He can be taken as a whole because there is a definable boundary to his set. There's another figure here, page 109. It must be kept in mind that Lacan's work on sexual difference is based on and coextensive with his reworking of traditional logic in terms of his own logic of the signifier. A signifier never stands alone. We would never talk about black if there were nothing but darkness around us, that is, no cases in which black was not found. It is because something other than black shows up on occasion that black takes on meaning. It is in opposition to white and all the other color words that the word black has meaning. While well, Lacan uses the language of the theory of classes in the early 60s, he continues to develop the same idea in the early 70s in terms of his own unique use of the symbols of classical logic. In Lezur D, for example, he says that there is no universal statement which can be controlled through an existence which negates it. In other words, every universal claim is grounded in the existence of an exception which proves the rule, to paraphrase a well-known French maxim. Man's essence, as wholly universally defined by the phallic function, thus necessarily implies the existence of the father. Without the father, man would be nothing, without form. Now the father is boundary to pursue the simile, occupies no area. He defines a two-dimensional surface within his boundaries, but fills no space. This father who marks the limit of a man's manhood is not just any old father. Lacan associates him with the primal father presented in Freud's Totem and Taboo, the father of the primal horde, who
who has not succumbed to castration and supposedly controls every single woman in the horde. While all men are par- while all men are marked by symbolic castration, there nonetheless exists or persists one man to whom the phallic function does not apply, one man who was never put in his place by succumbing to symbolic castration. He is not subject to the law. He is his own law. Does this primal father seemingly asserted to exist in Lacan's upper formula for masculine structure exist in the usual sense? No, he exists. The phallic function is not simply negated in some mild sense in his case. It is foreclosed. Lacan indicates that the bar of negation over the quantifier stands for discordance, whereas the bar of negation over the phallic function stands for foreclosure. And foreclosure implies the utter and complete exclusion of something from the symbolic register, as it is only that which is not foreclosed from the symbolic order that can be said to exist, existence going hand in hand with language. The primal father, implying such a foreclosure, must exist, standing outside of symbolic castration. We obviously have a name for him, and thus, in a sense, he exists within our symbolic order. On the other hand, his very definition implies a rejection of that order, and thus, by definition, he exists. His status is problematic. He is what Lacan, back in the 1950s, might have qualified as extimate, excluded from within. He can, however, be said to exist because, like object A in brackets, the primal father can be written a bunch of symbols. Now the mythical father of the primal horde is said not to have succumbed to castration, and what is symbolic castration but a limit or limitation? He thus knows no limits. According to Lacan, the primal father lumps all women into the same category, accessible. The set of all women exists for him and for him alone. His mother and sisters are just as much fair game as are his neighbors and second cousins. The effect of castration, the incest taboo in this case, is to divide that mythical set into at least two categories, accessible and inaccessible. Castration brings about an exclusion. Mom and sis are off limits. But castration also changes a man's relation to even those women who remain accessible. They become defined in a sense as simply not off limits. In Seminar 20, Lacan says that a man could only really jouir d'une femme from the position of non-castration. Jouir d'une femme means to get off on a woman, to really enjoy her, to take full advantage of her, the implication being that one's pleasure really comes from her, not from something one imagines her to be, wants her to be, fools oneself into believing she is or has or what have you. Only the primal father can really get off on women themselves. Ordinary masculine mortals must resign themselves to getting off on their partner. Object A in brackets. Thus, only the mythical primal father can have a true sexual relationship with a woman. I lost my spot somehow. To him, there is such a thing as a sexual relationship. Every other man has a relationship with object A in brackets, to wit, fantasy, not with a woman per se. The fact that every single man is nevertheless defined by both formulas, one stipulating that he is altogether castrated and the other that some instance negates or refuses castration, shows that incestuous wishes live on indefinitely in the unconscious. Every man, despite castration, that splitting up of the category of women into two two distinct groups, continues to have incestuous dreams in which he grants himself the privileges of the imagined pleasure-finding father who knows no bounds. Speaking in quantitative terms for a moment, Lacan can also be seen to be saying here that while there was, once upon a time, an exception to the rule of castration, you can be absolutely sure now whenever you meet a man, that he is castrated. So you can safely say that all people who are men, not in biological but rather in psychoanalytic terms, are castrated. But while men are wholly castrated, there is nevertheless a contradiction. 
that ideal of non-castration, of knowing no boundaries, no limitations, lives on somewhere, somehow, in each and every man. Masculine structure can, to modify figure 8.3, be de depicted as in figure 8.6. I don't know. There's all these figures, so like, I guess, page 112. Um, and then there's like these mathematical formulas with symbols that I don't know the names of, so I can't really explain it. This partial presentation of the formulas of sexuation should already make it clear to what extent Lacan's discussion of them is multi-layered, involving material from logic and linguistics, as well as from Freud. Feminine structure. As for the two formulas defining femininity, we find firstly that not all of a person who, regardless of anatomy, falls under the psychoanalytic category of women is defined by the phallic function. Not all of a woman comes under the law of the signifier. <clears throat> Lacan does not cast this idea in positive terms. By stating, for example, that some part of every woman escapes the reign of the phallus, he leaves it as a possibility, not a necessity, but that possibility is nevertheless decisive in the determination of sexual structure. The second formula states that you cannot find even one woman for whom the phallic function is totally inoperative. Every woman is at least in part determined by the phallic function. Such that, um, symbols that I can't read, i.e. such that the phallic function is inapplicable to it. Were the phallic function to be totally inoperative for a subject, he or she would be psychotic. The bar over the phallic function designating for a closure. The kind of image I find useful as a preliminary illustration of the two formulas for feminine structure is the tangent curve, where at, I don't, this is almost unintelligible at this point because there's so many symbols and I, like, I don't know what they mean because I'm not a mathematician. Like, this is algebra. Where at a bunch of symbols, the curve goes right off the map and then mysteriously reappears on the other side. We can attribute no real value to it at symbols and are forced to resort to expressions like the value of y approaches positive infinity as x goes to symbols from zero and approaches negative infinity as x goes from symbol to symbol. No one really knows how the two sides of the curve meet up, but we adopt a system of symbols with which to talk about its value at that point. The status of the other jouissance associated with the lower formula of feminine structure. A bunch of symbols. Potentially ex experienceable by those who come under the category women is akin to that of the value of the tangent curve at a bunch of symbols. It goes right off the scale, right off the map of representation. Its status is akin to that of a logical exception, a case which throws into question the whole. The formula a bunch of symbols, summarizes, in a sense, the fact that while not all of a woman is determined by the phallic function, to assert the existence of some, for some part of her that rejects the phallic function would amount to claiming that something that says no to the phallic function is nevertheless subject to it, situated within the symbolic order. For to exist is to have a place within the symbolic register, which is why Lacan never claims that the feminine in instance posited to go beyond the phallus exists. He maintains its radical alterity in relation to logos, to the symbolic order as structured by the signifier of desire, while denying the existence of this realm beyond the phallus. Bunch of symbols does not, as we shall see further on, in any way deny its existence. Woman is thus not somehow less complete than man, for man is whole only with respect to the phallic function. Women are no less whole than men except when considered in terms of the phallic function. Women are no more undefined or indefinite than men except in relation to the phallic function. A dissymmetry of partners. The phallus, one of woman's partners. Oh, it's like woman is struck out. So I guess that's probably important. 
Consider now the symbols, or mathemes, as Lacan calls them, located under the formulas of sexuation. In figure 8.8, .8, we see that the crossed out la, symbolizing in one sense that woman is not whole, while linked by arrows indicating woman's partners, on the one hand to phi, the phallus as signifier, is linked on the other to S, A in brackets, the signifier of the lack in the other. I discussed the phallus as signifier of desire in some detail at the beginning of this chapter. What it can adds here is the notion that a woman generally gains access to the signifier of desire in our culture via a man or a masculine instance, that is, someone who comes under the psychoanalytic category men. <sighs> S, A in brackets, woman's other partner. Again, woman is struck out, so. Si quelque chose existe à quelque chose, c'est très précisément de n'y être pas couplé, d'en être troisi, si vous me permettez ce néologisme. So that was a quote from Lacan in French. <laughs> Looking back at our table, we see that women, while coupled on the one hand to the phallus, are also inextricably tripled to the signifier of a lack or whole in the other. That lack is not simply the lack directly correlated with desire that shows that langu language is ridden with desire and that one's mother or father, as an avatar of the other, is not complete and thus wants for something. For the signifier of that desire implying lack, or lack implying desire, is the phallic signifier itself. Lacan is not terribly loquacious in the 1970s regarding S A in brackets, and thus I will offer my own interpretation of its function here. In chapter 5, I spoke of S A in brackets as the signifier of the other's desire, in the, in the context of Lacan's discussion of Hamlet in seminar Six. In seminar six. I lost my spot. At that stage in Lacan's work, S.A. in brackets seems to be Lacan's term for the phallus as signifier. And thus, in a sense, it is what allows Lacan to first separate the phallus as imaginary from the phallus as symbolic. Symbols, meanings often evolve very significantly over time in Lacan's texts, and it would suggest that S.A. in brackets shifts between seminars 6 and 20, from designating the signifier of the other's lack or desire to designating the signifier of the first loss. That shift corresponds to a change in register, as is so often the case in Lacan's work, from symbolic to real. Note that all of the elements found under men are related to the symbolic, whereas all those under women are related to the real. That first loss can be understood in quite a variety of ways. It might be understood at the frontier of the symbolic and the real as the loss of a first signifier, S1, the mother's desire, when primal repression occurs. The disappearance of that first signifier is necessary for the instituting of the signifying order as such. An exclusion must occur for something else to come into being. The status of that first excluded signifier is obviously quite different from that of other signifiers, being more of a border phenomenon between the symbolic and the real, and bears close affinities to that of a primordial loss or lack at the origin of the subject. I would suggest that the first exclusion or loss somehow finds a representative or signifier, S, A in brackets. Now, what does it mean for something real, a real loss or exclusion, to find a signifier? For the real is generally considered to be unsignifiable. If the real finds a signifier, that signifier must be operating in a way that is highly unusual. For the signifier generally replaces, crosses out, and annihilates the real. It signifies a subject to another signifier, but it does not signify the real as such. My sense here is that S.A. in brackets in figure 8.8, .8, which Lacan associates in seminar 20 with specifically feminine jouissance, designates a kind of Freudian sublimation 
of the drives in which the drives are fully satisfied. This other kind of satisfaction is what is behind Lacan's expression, other jouissance, and a kind of Lacanian sublimation whereby an ordinary object is elevated to the status of the thing. The Freudian thing finds a signifier, simple examples of which may include God, Jesus, Mary, the Virgin, art, music, and so on, and the finding of the signifier must be understood as an encounter, that is, as fortuitous in some sense. Apart from the imaginary satisfaction we, we may associate with religious ecstasy or rapture, or with the artist's or musician's work, there is nevertheless a real satisfaction obtained, and that strikes me as Lacan's beyond of neurosis, for those with feminine structure. In chapters 5 and 6, I characterize Lacan's first conceptualization of beyond of neurosis as the subjectifying of the cause, becoming one's own cause, as paradoxical as that may at first sound. By Seminar 20, it seems that Lacan views that as one path beyond neurosis, the path of those characterized by masculine structure. The other path, that of sublimation, is particular to those characterized by feminine structure. The masculine path might then be qualified as that of desire, becoming one's own cause of desire, while the feminine path would be that of love. And as we shall see, masculine subjectification might then be considered to involve the making one's own of otherness qua efficient cause, the signifier, while feminine subjectification would involve the making one's own of otherness qua material cause, the letter. They would both then require subjectification of the cause or otherness, but of different facets thereof. I shall return to this subject momentarily. Woman does not exist. Woman again is crossed out. The la, which is also crossed out, in the table under the formulas of sexuation is Lacan's shorthand for the notion that woman does not exist. There's no signifier for or essence of woman as such. <clears throat> woman can thus only be written under erasure, so woman crossed out. If, as Lacan suggests, there is no such signifier, the underlying idea presumably being that the phallus is somehow the signifier of man or man's essence, since the phallic function is what defines him. The fact that S A in brackets is one of woman's partners suggests that a signifier may be encountered and adopted, in some sense coming to take the place of that missing definition or essence. S A in brackets stands in for a signifier that is neither ready-made nor prêt à porter, and represents the forging of a new master signifier S one, though not one to which a woman is subjected. While a man is always subjected to a master signifier, a woman's relation thereto seems radically different. A master signifier serves as a limit to a man, not so for S A in brackets in relation to a woman. Socially speaking, Lacan's assertion that there is no signifier of for a woman is no doubt related to the fact that a woman's position in her culture is either automatically defined by the man she adopts as partner or is defined only with great difficulty. Um, in other words, <clears throat> the search for another way of defining herself is long and fraught with obstacles. The Western societal other never views such attempts very favorably, and thus the satisfaction which could be derived therefrom is often spoiled. Music, art, opera, theatre, dance, and other fine arts are fairly well accepted by that other, though less so when a relationship with a man is not proven primary. And whereas in the past it was fairly well accepted for women to devote themselves to the religious life in convents, eschewing the defining relation to a man, today even that recourse is frowned upon. That is to say, the other is making certain religious signifiers harder and harder to adopt. For while the relation to S, A, in brackets may be established by encounter, that encounter can be facilitated or thwarted by the culture and subcultures in which a woman finds herself. This by no means implies that there will never be an automatic or ready-made signifier for women. 
If we accept Lacan's diagnosis here, the state of affairs is contingent, not necessary. Nor does Lacan in any way imply that women have no sexual identity of their own. He does not, as it is sometimes said in the literature, define women simply as men that have something missing. Sexual identity in Lacanian terms is constituted on at least two different levels. One, the successive identifications that constitute the ego, usually identifications with one or both par parents, accounting for an imaginary level of sexual identity, a rigid level which often comes into very real conflict with two, masculine or feminine structure as defined above, as related to the different sides of Lacan's formulas of sexuation, any given subject being able to situate herself on either side. These two levels, which often come into conflict, thus correspond to the ego and the subject. At the level of ego identifications, a woman may, may well identify with her father, or figure who is socially considered to be masculine, whereas at the level of desire and of her subjective capacity for jouissance, she may be characterized by feminine structure. A woman's sexual identity can, in fact, involve many different possible combinations, for unlike masculine and feminine structure, which in Lacan's view constitute an either-or, there being no middle ground between them. Ego identifications can include elements from many different persons, both male and female. In other words, the imaginary level of sexual identity can, in and of itself, be extremely self-contradictory. The very existence of sexual identity, sexuation to use Lacan's term, at a level other than that of the ego, at the level of subjectivity, should dispel the mistaken notion so prevalent in the English-speaking world that a woman is not considered to be a subject at all in Lacanian theory. Feminine structure means feminine subjectivity, insofar as a woman... Insofar... Fuck... Insofar as a woman forms a relationship with a man, she is likely to be reduced to an object, object A in brackets, in his fantasy, and insofar as she is viewed from the perspective of masculine culture, she is likely to be reduced to nothing more than a collection of male fantasy objects, dressed up in culturally stereotypical clothes. I, A in brackets, that is, an image that contains and yet disguises object A. That may very well imply a loss of subjectivity in the common, everyday sense of the word. Being in control of one's life, being an agent to be reckoned with, and so on. But it in no way implies a loss of subjectivity in the Lacanian sense of the term. Um... The very adoption of position or stance with respect to an experience of jouissance involves and implies subjectivity. Once adopted, a feminine subject will have come into being. The extent to which that particular subject subjectivizes her or his world is another question. <clears throat> Some of the work being done by certain feminists today might be understood as involving the attempt to present, represent, symbolize, and thereby subjectify a certain real in their experience, which has never before been represented, symbolized, or subjectified. Perhaps that previously unspoken, unwritten real is related to what Lacan calls the other jouissance and the other sex. Um, women constituting the other sex, even for a woman. This point is discussed further below. The latter are other, foreign or alien to someone, only insofar as they have not been spoken, written, represented, or subjectified, while many feminists view their work in other terms, as having to do with a specifically feminine, imaginary, or pre-thetic, semiotic level of experience. It might, in more strictly Lacanian terms, and at the risk of being reductionistic, be understood as an attempt to subjectify the real, the real other, or the other as jouissance. Masculine, feminine, signifier, signifierness. Let me pursue my interpretation a step further here. 
While a Ken never comes right out and says that man is defined by the signifier of desire, let us suppose for a moment that he is so defined. Does this I'm so confused. Does this necessarily imply that woman can never be defined as long as man is defined? And does that in turn imply that there are that were woman to be identified with the signifier of desire, man could not be defined? Is there some structural reason why the signifier of desire may be identified with only one sex at a time? Even if either one theoretically? If so, is the opposite sex then necessarily associated with the object as cause of desire? Is there some theoretical reason why one sex should be defined by a signifier and the other as an object? <clears throat> Perhaps there is, insofar as separation leads to the division of the other into barred other and object A in brackets. The other, e.g. the parental other in the nuclear family, mother and father, breaks down into two parts, one of which, A in brackets, can certainly be associated with a signifier, and the other with an object. In terms of the Lacanian dialectic of desire as it operates in in sorry, as it operates in societies organized like our own, perhaps there is a theoretical reason why the roles of signifier and object are embodied in the different sexes. And then there's, there's a figure eight point nine, and this is page one eighteen. The implication of Lacan's work on sexuation seems to be that subjectification takes place at different levels in differently sexuated beings. Those with masculine structure must subjectify or find a new relation to the object, while those with feminine structure must subjectify or find a new, a new relation to the signifier. Both sexes subjectify that which is other at the outset, yet their approach to this other, the facet of the other they deal with, differs. It is as, as if the other were instated lock, stock, and barrel in men, their problem being with the object, whereas in women the other is never completely instated as such. Woman's problem thus would not be to make the other exist or to complete it, which is, after all, the pervert's project, but rather to subjectify it, to constitu constitute it within itself. Subjectification for those characterized by feminine structure would thus be quite different from that outlined in chapter 5 and 6 above and would require an encounter with a signifier. Men and women are alienated in and by language in radically different ways, as witnessed by their disparate relations to the other and to S1 and S2. As subjects, they are split differently, and this difference in splitting accounts for sexual difference. Sexual difference thus stems from men and women's divergent relations to the signifier. Each sex seems to be called upon to play a part related to the very foundation of language. Men play the part of the signifier, while women play the part of l'être de la sign, signifiance, as Lacan puts it. To date, no other ang to date, no other English speaker has, to the best of my knowledge, attempted to translate signifiance. Yet it is fairly clear from Lacan's usage what he is trying to get at with this term taken over from linguistics. It is taken over in the sense that in linguistics it merely refers to the fact of having meaning, whereas Lacan turns it on its head. I have proposed translating it as signifierness. That is, the fact of being a signifier, the fact that signifiers exist, the subsistence of signifiers, the signifying nature of signifiers. While Lacan uses the term, it is to emphasize the nonsensical nature of the signifier, the very existence of signifiers apart from and separated from any possible meaning or signification they might have. It is to emphasize the fact that the signifier's very existence exceeds its significatory role, that its substance exceeds its symbolic function. The signifier's being goes beyond its designated role, its role in logos, which is to signify. Thus, rather than referring to the fact of having meaning, Lacan uses it to refer to the fact of having effects other than meaning effects. 
We should hear defiance in Lacan's sig- significance. The signifier defies the role allotted to it, refusing to be altogether relegated to the task of signification. It has an existence beyond and outside of meaning-making, sense-making. Being in Lacan's work is associated with the letter, the letter in the 1970s, being the material, non-signifying face of the signifier, the part that has effects without signifying, jouissance effects. The letter is related to the materiality of language, the substance, jouissant, as Lacan puts it in Seminar 20. The jouissance or jouissing substance, the substance that gets off or enjoys. To associate the masculine with the signifier and the feminine with the letter may seem tantamount to return to the old form and matter metaphor dating back to at least Plato. But in Lacan's work, there is always a twist to the return Substance gets the better of form and teaches it a trick or two. Other to herself, other jouissance. In what sense can a woman be considered to be an other to herself, as Lacan suggests, insofar as she defines herself in terms of a man, in terms of the phallus, via that man, that other aspect, the potential relation to S, A in brackets, remains opaque, foreign, other, Consider what Lacan says in 1958 and 1962. Man serves here in relation to castration as a, rel- as a relay so that woman becomes an other for herself, just as she is for him. Seeing herself only in terms of the phallus, that is, in terms of her position as defined in relation to a man, other women who do not seem to be thus defined are cast as other, insofar, however, as the other potential is realized, that is, a relation to S, A, in brackets is established. Woman is no longer an other to herself. Insofar as it is not re- realized, she remains in homosexual, as Lacan writes it, conflating man, homme, um, and homosexual. She loves men, she loves like a man, and her desire is structured in fantasy like this. To those characterized by masculine structure, a woman is cast as other as radically other, as the other of, as jouissance, insofar as she embodies or is seen as representative of the other jouissance Lacan calls indecent. Why indecent? Because it requires no relation to the phallus and shows up the paucity of phallic jouissance, which is the mere pittance of pleasure left after paucity, oh sorry, left after the drives have been thoroughly subjected, in the case of masculine structure, to the symbolic. This subjection, this subjection of the drives corresponds to a certain Freudian form of sublimation, the one wherein the real is drained off into the symbolic, jouissance being transferred to the other. The other jouissance involves a form of sublimation through love that provides full satisfaction of the drives. The other jouissance is a jouissance of love, and Lacan relates it to religious ecstasy and to a kind of bodily corporal jouissance that is not localized in the genitals, the way phallic jouissance is. The former is not, he clearly states, so-called vaginal orgasm as opposed to clitoral. According to Lacan, the other jouissance is asexual, whereas phallic jouissance is sexual, and yet it is of and in the body. Phallic jouissance involving but the organ is instrument of the signifier. The little Lacan directly says about S, A in brackets suggests that the other jouissance it denotes has to do with the absolute radicality or otherness of the other. There is no other, i.e. no outside of the other. The other is not just an outside relative to a particular determinate inside. It is always and inescapably other, outside and any and all systems. I will leave a detailed explanation of the other jouissance for another occasion, suggesting here simply that it is related to Freud's notion that the full satisfaction of the drives provided by one form of sublimation is desexualized. Desexualized libido seems closely related to Lacan's asexual um, other jouissance. 
Sublimation is incidentally situated by Lacan in a somewhat different context, in the bottom left-hand corner of the logical square I presented in chapter 4 and 6 above. No comments here amount to no more than the beginning of an interpretation, but this strikes me as a general sense in which figures 8.8 could be understood. As I indicated earlier, Lacan set out to show, one, that the sexes are defined separately and differently, and two, that their partners are neither symmetrical nor overlapping. Man's partner, as seen in figure 8.8, .8, is object A in brackets, not a woman as such. A man may thus get off on something he gets from a woman, a certain way she talks, a certain way she looks at him, and so forth. But it is only insofar as he has invented her, or invested her with that precious object that arouses his desire. He may thus need a biologically defined woman as the substratum, prop, or medium of object A in brackets. But she will never be his partner. Nor will he ever be hers as such. She may require a biologically defined man to embody, incarnate, or serve as prop for the phallus for her. But it is the phallus and not the man that will be her partner. The break or dissymmetry is even more radical when it comes to her other partner, S A in brackets, as that partner is not situated under men at all, and thus a woman need not have no recourse to a man to relate or accede to it. Had men and women's sexual partners turned out to be identical, had, say, object A in brackets function as the sole partner for both of them, at least their desire as sexuated beings would be structured in some sort of parallel way, and we could try to envision a sexual relationship between them on that basis. But the, dis but the dissymmetry of their partners is utter and complete, and no conceivable relationship between the sexes can thus be postulated, articulated, or written in any form whatsoever. The Truth of Psychoanalysis that is what Lacan generally qualifies as the truth of psychoanalysis. Granted, he at times suggests that all truth is mathematizable. There is no such thing as a truth which is not mathematized. Mathemati mathemat fuck. Mathematicized. That doesn't... Oh, fuck, whatever. That is written, that is, which is not based, qua truth solely upon axioms which is to say that there is truth, but of that which has no meaning, that is, of that concerning, which there are no other consequences to be drawn but within the register of mathematical deduction. But this common applies merely to the true, le vrai, we see, for example, in truth ta tables, in symbolic logic. The only truth of psychoanalysis, according to Lacan, is that there is no such thing as a sexual relationship, the problem being to bring the subject to the point of encountering that truth. Existence and existence. N'existe que ce qui peut se dire. N'existe que ce qui peut s'écrire. Given Lacan's many seemingly paradoxical statements involving existence, women does not exist, the other jouissance does not exist, and involving il y a and il n'y a pas, there's no such thing as a sexual relationship. Il y a de l'un, il n'y a pas d'autre de l'autre. I like to add a word here about Lacan's notion of existence. To the best of my knowledge, the word existence was first introduced into French in translations of Heidegger, e.g. of being in time, as a translation for the Greek ecstasis and the German ecstasy. <clears throat> the root meaning of the term in Greek is standing outside of or standing apart from something. In Greek, it was generally used for the removal or displacement of something. But it also came to be, be applied to states of mind that we would now call ecstatic. Thus, a derivative meaning of the word is ecstasy, hence its relation to the other jouissance. Heidegger often played on the root meaning of the word standing outside or stepping outside oneself, but also on its close connection in Greek with the root of the word for existence. Lacan uses it to talk about an existence which stands apart from, which insists, as it were, from the outside, something not included on the inside, something which, rather than being intimate, is extimate. 
The other jouissance is beyond the symbolic, standing apart from symbolic castration. It exists. We can discern a place for it within our symbolic order and even name it, but it nevertheless remains ineffable, unspeakable. We can consider it to exist because it can be written a bunch of symbols. Sexual relationships, however, are distinct in this respect. They cannot be written and thus neither exist nor exist. There is simply no such thing. The very notion of existence and of the other jouissance as existing makes Lacan's economy of jouissance or libidinal economy an open, untotalizable economy. There is no conservation of jouissance, no proportionate relationship between jouissance um, sacrificed and jouissance gained, no sense in which the other jouissance makes up for or makes good the inadequacy or paucity of phallic jouissance. In a word, no complementarity, complementarity or commensuration. The other jouissance is fundamentally incommensurate, unquantifiable, disproportionate and indecent to polite society. It can never be recuperated into a phallic economy or simple structuralism. Like object, A in brackets, as existence, the other jouissance has an irremediable effect on the smooth workings of structure. A new metaphor for sexual difference. The signifier is to be structured in topological terms. It's from Seminar 20. What are we to make of Lacan's view of sexual difference as I have tried to lay it out here? Is it to be taken seriously? How is it helpful to us? Clearly, Lacan provides a new metaphor of sexual difference, one that goes beyond the dialectic of active and passive, with which Freud himself was unsatisfied, having in being far more interesting, at least from a grammatical linguistic standpoint, and so on. One thing most contemporary critics and psychoanalysts would agree upon is that biological differentiations are inadequate, too many people seeming to cross over at the psychical level, the hard and fast lines of biologically determined sexual difference. We thus begin with the hypotheses, hypothesis that there are males with feminine structure defined in some way and females with masculine structure defined in some other way. What is of interest in Lacan's way of defining masculine and feminine structure? For one thing, it involves a new topology, it breaks with the age-old Western conception of the world as a series of concentric circles or spheres, and instead takes as its model such paradoxical topological surfaces as the Mobius band, the Klein bottle, and the cross cap. The latter, in particular, is a fertile surface for revolutionizing the way we think. If there is a strict equivalence between topology and structure, then new topological models may be helpful in thinking about systems. In essence, the cross cap is a sphere with a twist, the Lacanian twist, so to speak. That little twist changes all of the topological properties of the sphere, nothing returning upon itself, as in the old familiar conception of things. It is perhaps the same Lacanian twist with, which, in the late 1950s and 1960s, shifts so many of Lacan's terms from the symbolic to the real. This process finally comes to an end, in a sense, when Lacan encounters the Baromian knot, which takes the three registers, the imaginary, symbolic, and real, as equally important. The Lacanian twist is perhaps the ability to see something beyond the symbolic where philosophy and structuralism see nothing but the same old thing. Unlike the Mobius band, the cross cap is an impossible surface. The former can be constructed. Thus, it is imaginable or imaginarizable. It can be pictured in the mind. The cross cap, on the other hand, is a surface that can be described in the same way as are a number of other surfaces in topology, with little rectangles with arrows along their edges indicating how the opposite sides go together. Yet it is, or yet is impossible to construct. Consider the surfaces represented in figure 8.11. This is on page 124. There are multiple 
images for this, I don't know. All of these surfaces, except for the cross cap, lend themselves to accurate visual representation, while the cross, co cross cap can be symbolically expressed in topological terms. It can neither be accurately visualized nor constructed. To try to imagine it, you can picture to yourself a sphere that is slashed at a certain spot, each point on either side of the cut being connected not to the point directly across from it, as in suturing a wound, but to the symmetrical point on the opposite side, as in figure 8.12, where A would be connected to B and A to B. Again, this is page 124. The cross cap is, in this sense, impossible, yet it can be written. It is susceptible to symbolic inscription. The symbolic can be used here to describe something real, something extra symbolic. If the old notion of concentric circles or spheres ever applied to anything, Lacan seems to suggest that it applies to masculine structure, bounded as it is by the paternal function. Freud suggests that women have a different relation to the law, which he correlates with a less highly developed ego ideal or super ego, but which perhaps can be better understood as implying that the relations to boundaries of subjects characterized by feminine structure are fundamentally different. The opposition between inside and outside is inapplicable. Just so, the surface of the cross cap does not constitute a hermetic boundary, and there is but a locally valid notion of inside and outside, not a definitive one. That little anomalous rent in its surface changes all of its properties. Another way to formulate Lacan's new metaphor is with the terms open and closed, as derived from set theory in topology. Like the set constituted by man, a closed set includes its own boundary or limit. Like woman, an open set does not include its own boundary or limit. It could be argued that it is, at least in part thanks to Lacan's work in set theory, logic, and topology, rather unusual fields of study for most psychoanalysts, that he is able to formulate sexual difference in a new way. Lacan's new metaphor for sexual difference constitutes a new symptom, a new symptomatic way of viewing sexual difference that is neither any more nor any less symptomatic than earlier ways. A symptom always allows one to see certain things and stops one from seeing other things. Were I to qualify this symptomatic way of seeing, I might be tempted to call it Gaudelian structuralism insofar as it maintains the importance of structure, while continually pointing to the necessary incompleteness thereof and the fundamental indecidability of certain statements made within it. Lacan clearly adopts the Godel Godelian notions that every significant formal system contains some undecidable statements, and that it is impossible to define the truth of a language in that same language. In Lacan's work, it is not simply the exception that proves the rule, but more radically the exception that forces us to redefine the rules. His work embodies the very structure of hysteria. The closer he comes to formulating a system, the more vigorously he re-examines it and calls it into question. If it is a system to end all systems, it is Lacan who teaches us to hear that very expression in a new way.